Good evening and a very, very warm welcome to our evening service here at Grove Chapel. It's good to know that there are not only the folk who uh, usually join us here when the building here is open on Sundays, as we trust it will be before very long, but we also hope many, many people uh, in the neighbourhood and elsewhere uh, joining us now for our evening worship. So let us come together. Let's remember that we come to a God who is in every place. He is not tied to church buildings. He dwells in the hearts of those who know him and love him. Let's come and pray to him now. Lord God, we thank you for your eternal promises, which are yes and amen in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Saviour. And we pray that tonight, once more, you would be with us, you would come to us as we listen and as we worship, and that by your Holy Spirit, Lord God, you would change our lives and make us more like the Saviour who came to save us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our reading for this evening comes from the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. It's in the Old Testament. He's one of the minor prophets, one of the prophets who wrote a little less than some of the other prophets of the Old Testament. And uh, the reading from Habakkuk comes from the last four verses of his book. That's chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. And you will hear those words being read to you and you will see them also on the screen. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength, he makes my feet like the deer's, he makes me tread on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. Some of you uh, here from Grove Chapel may remember that we went through this book of Habakkuk on a number of Wednesday evenings last year. There isn't time uh, today to go over the whole background and context of that book. Let me just give for this evening a few details which we need to know. Who is this man called Habakkuk? Well, he was a prophet who lived in the southern kingdom of Judah in Old Testament times, to be a little more precise, sometime around the year 630 BC. But we really can't be sure. We know less about Habakkuk uh, than we know perhaps about almost any other Old Testament prophet. Now, to be as brief as I possibly can be, Habakkuk was living at a time when he was anticipating a disaster which would come very soon in the history of his people, the history of Judah. What was that impending disaster? It was the Babylonian invasion, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the exile to the city of Babylon, which would follow. But let's make it a little bit stronger than simply anticipating. Habakkuk is a prophet. He's a man sent by God and given a message by God. And he is not only anticipating, but prophesying these events. The Lord God, the creator of heaven and earth, 
had revealed to his servant, his prophet Habakkuk, that these hard and terrible and frightening things are about to take place. And it's because he's so keenly aware of them that he speaks as he does in verse 16, which we had read to us. I'll read it again. He says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. In this verse, there is a strange mixture, you notice, of fear and calm, of alarm and quiet, of terror and peace. What a strange, impossible combination, we might think. How is this possible? Well, the verses which follow help us to understand. And the best approach tonight to this passage is to take it one verse at a time and actually to think about the very first word of each verse, verses 17, 18, and 19. So what's the first word in verse 17? It's the word though, though. It suggests that something rather forbidding and rather frightening is about to happen, and that's exactly what we read. Let me read verse 17 again. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. What kind of picture do we have here? It all sounds rather dismal, doesn't it? Well, it is. It's a picture of everything going wrong, everything failing, everything lacking, everything being missing. You go to find something that you're looking forward to finding, and it's not there. And specifically, it's a picture of famine and hunger and shortage. The fig tree does not even blossom, meaning that no figs will grow later in the year to be plucked and eaten and enjoyed. The vines may be in the vineyard, but when you go and look on them, you find no grapes. There can be no grapes on the vine and no wine to gladden the hearts of men. You go to the olive groves, and sure, the trees are there, and even their fruit might be there, but this fruit appears to be dry and withered and cannot produce the oil which was and is such a staple produce of Mediterranean countries. Figs, vines, olives, fruits which are so commonly associated with and symbolic of the lands of Israel and Judah. And indeed, powerful biblical pictures of God's blessing on their land. You know, these three fruits are not just plucked, as it were, randomly. They are quite deliberately chosen. They stand for God's blessing on the land he gave to his people. If you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, Chapter 8 and verse 8, this is how the Lord described the land which the children of Israel were going to enter and inherit as a gift from the Lord himself. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey. There, in that land, the Lord said, you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. But now the fruit is gone. Now the fields are empty and barren, and the lack extends further. There are no sheep in the fields or in the folds. There are no cattle in the stalls. There is shortage. There is famine. There is agricultural and economic catastrophe. 
Forget the Israelite or Judahite gross domestic product falling by 14% or even 35%. It seems to have fallen by a much rounder figure than that, 100%. Such is the kind of devastation that Habakkuk fears will be wrought, will be brought about by the soon-to-arrive marauding Babylonians. Now, how can we understand and apply this Old Testament passage from well over two and a half thousand years ago to our day today? Maybe it doesn't seem quite so obvious to us. At least, COVID-19 has not emptied our shelves of food. In fact, there seems to be a return of a good deal of food and other supplies to supermarket shelves. But we can nevertheless apply some of this economically to our society. Many small and some not so small businesses have collapsed and many more surely will collapse. Unemployment will shoot up. Countries, including our own, will be faced with large budget deficits, which could lead to crippling new measures. But I think we can apply it more than economically. We can apply it socially. Can you imagine a land thousands of years ago where the vines, the olives, the figs, the fruits, the enjoyment has all gone? What would that kind of place become socially? And we are living through a time of social emptying, aren't we? The hustle and bustle of city life, certainly here in London, has largely quietened. Camberwell Grove, by the middle of the day, is as quiet as rural Shropshire in the middle of the night. There's no such thing as a rush hour anymore. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Near empty buses and trains rattle by. The schools have been emptied of energetic children. The busy streets and shops are deserted. The excited crowds of people on Friday nights in restaurants and pubs have disappeared. The beaches and national parks are unvisited. And people are isolating themselves. No happy Easter get-togethers last weekend for families. Grandparents living alone and unvisited, except via devices with screens, which is much better than nothing, isn't it? But no substitute for actually being together in the same room, eating from the same table. But I think we can, imply, we can apply it even further. We can apply it to ourselves as God's people everywhere, and especially brothers and sisters at Grove Chapel, to God's people who usually meet in this building. After all, understand this, the Bible is addressed first and foremost to God's people. We can apply it directly to ourselves here at Grove Chapel. I'm preaching this evening to rows and rows of empty pews which should have people sitting in them, you sitting in them. No voices are raised in songs of praise in this building today as they ought to be. We are not seeing each other's faces or hearing each other's voices except through digital screens and the digital mashing up of sound. We are not able to shake each other's hands or hug each other. The children are not lining up here on the front row as they used to for the children's talk on a Sunday morning. And we are prevented from breaking and eating the one loaf of Christ's body and drinking from that cup which represents his blood. And let me be completely straight and honest with all of you. This is not how it's meant to be. Church was never meant to operate like this. This strange situation 
is something that we have to tolerate for as long as we must. But it's not a situation that any of us should ever get used to, much less begin to prefer. My earnest hope and prayer, and I trust yours as well, is that we will all long and ache to be truly back together again. We do not, we do not want to rush back prematurely into this building too early and then be told within weeks we have to vacate it again. We must wait until the season and the time is right. But we must look forward to the day when as many of us as possible, and it won't be possible for all of us, can return here. Though, though the fig tree does not blossom, though the doors of this church do not open, what will we do? The second word from verse 18 is the word yet. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Now, let's come back to our friend Habakkuk. Think for a moment. How can he say anything like this? How is it possible to rejoice in a famine? How is it possible to rejoice when you have an aching belly, a throbbing head, a dry, parched mouth, a wife and children who are anxious, babies who are undernourished. How is it possible to rejoice when everything is against you? How is it possible to rejoice when a barbaric army of invading Babylonians is about to besiege your city and cut off all supply of food. Is Habakkuk deluding himself? Is he denying the basic evidence of his senses? Is he living in some cloud cuckoo land? Has he any notion of what a famine will really be like? Is he full of bravado? Is he saying, well, I'll be fine. I think I'll get by. I'm going to be okay in all of this. Wait a moment. Look at the words of Habakkuk the prophet. I will rejoice in the Lord. Have you heard those words before? Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. If we know our Bibles at all, we know it's an expression which pops up in a few places in the Bible. More than a few places. Here are some of them. Three from the Psalms, Psalm 35, verse 9. Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. See, the word salvation appears there as it does here in Habakkuk. Psalm 64, verse 10. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exult. And then Psalm 97 and verse 12. Again, those words, rejoice in the Lord O you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. But there's one book in the Bible where the words rejoice in the Lord are sounded with a special feeling. Not just once, but twice. And on the second occasion, with an exhortation to say them again and again and again. Do you know which book I'm talking about? That's right. We're talking about Paul's letter to the Philippians. And Philippians 3 verse 1, Paul says this. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Oh, yes, he says, it's safe for me always to tell you to rejoice in the Lord. Maybe he's got Habakkuk in mind as he says that. And in case we hadn't heard Paul properly the first time, he goes on uh, a few verses later, in fact, in chapter 4 and verse 4, to say, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, this is the question. 
What's the context and the background to Paul's words? What makes it so amazing that he writes them? It is that Paul the Apostle, alone in prison, is undergoing, we might say today, a kind of self-isolation far more stringent than anything that we have ever known. He's in prison for the sake of his preaching of the gospel. But what does he say as this imprisoned Christian preacher? Listen again to Philippians 4, verse 11 to 13. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. A man in a bleak first century AD Roman prison cell. Perhaps we might say the New Testament equivalent of Habakkuk. And it's a pretty bleak place to be in the middle of a Roman prison cell. Not many figs growing there, not many grapes, not many olives in a Roman prison cell. But Paul rejoices in the Lord. And what is more, Paul is certainly able to say, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Now, think with me for a few minutes about why Paul is rejoicing and what is it in him that makes him rejoice? Why is Paul rejoicing? There are clues in Philippians as to why he might be rejoicing. He says early on in the letter that even though he is in prison, it is quite clear that his imprisonment has actually turned out for, uh, for the spread of the gospel, for the advance of the gospel. Many, many people, even in the household of the Roman emperor, Caesar, realize that Paul is in prison and in chains because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that, of course, is giving Paul a great deal of joy. It's giving Paul great joy to know that the gospel is spreading all over the known world and churches are growing, and souls are being saved. That is giving Paul a great deal of joy. But it's more than that. It is clearly Paul's own personal joy, just as it is Habakkuk's personal joy. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Paul has found Christ to be so near to him in the middle of a prison cell. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. He's found this before. Perhaps, as Paul writes to the Philippians, his mind goes back some eight, nine, or ten years uh, to a, a night when he was in another prison, in that very city of Philippi itself, to which church he is writing. And what was he doing there? Well, then he was with his companion Silas, and they were in prison because they had been preaching Christ and causing a stir in that city. And what were they doing in the innermost cell of that prison in Philippi all those years earlier? They'd been singing hymns at midnight, They'd been rejoicing in the Lord, and the Lord had worked a mighty salvation that night. And now, an older, more seasoned, even wiser Apostle Paul is discovering new heights of joy in knowing Christ's presence in a prison cell. Like many since, Paul is a Christian who is singing in the fire, He's not singing in the rain, he's singing in the fire. And there are many others who have sung in the fire of affliction 
and imprisonment and suffering and torture and in the face of death ever since that time. I've often from this uh, place mentioned the 20th century Romanian pastor Richard Wurmbrandt. Not only imprisoned for two long spells of custody, one of them some seven or eight years, the next one about six years or so, not only imprisoned, but interrogated, tormented by his communist captors, and indeed tortured with broken body and burned skin. And yet, a man who testified later on to how night after night he rejoiced in the Lord and even danced with joy in his Romanian prison cell throughout the long months and years of his captivity. What is Paul's secret? What is Habakkuk's secret? What was Richard Wurmbrandt's secret? How can we get hold of this? What is the secret of every tried and tested believer who is able to say, I will rejoice in the Lord? Here's the answer. It's the living presence of Jesus Christ in the heart. It's the fellowship and enjoyment of the risen Jesus, whom we thought about this morning, in the soul. It's his resurrection life being lived out in the hearts, minds of all his people. This is what enables his people to do all things through the living Christ who strengthens them. Yes, things may be tough, very, very tough. Yet, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. But maybe we have one more question. What is the very source and, and engine and originator and author and mover of this joy, of this rejoicing? How is this joy fueled? How is it carried on? Well, we've already said it's the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And that takes us to the final verse. And the first word of the final verse is God. Verse 19, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Yes, we've already read Paul's words, the Apostle Paul. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And he is, it occurs to me as I preach this passage, he is surely thinking of Habakkuk. There is a, a, a clear allusion back to Habakkuk 3 in the words of Paul because not only is rejoicing there, so is the word strength. God the Lord is my strength. God the Lord. Notice how Habakkuk says the name of God twice. The Lord the Lord is my strength. Do you notice this? He doesn't say God gives me strength. He doesn't say thinking about God fills me with strength. He doesn't say God tells me how I can make myself strong. God is my strength. And that's the most amazing strength in the entire universe. It's an eternal strength. It's an infinite strength. It's a strength that can be found by anyone and everyone who trusts in God through Jesus Christ for their salvation. One of the most heartwarming stories, I'm sure you'll agree, in this last week in the news is that story of Captain Tom Moore, the World War II veteran who will have his 100th birthday on the last day of this month of April 2020. What did he do? He walked a hundred laps of his 25 metre garden to raise money for the NHS. 
And as he set out to do this, he thought, well, I might be able to raise 5,000 pounds. Wouldn't that be a wonderful amount to raise for the National Health Service? But that might be a bit steep, he thought. Well, he was wonderfully mistaken, wasn't he? You know the rest of the story. So many thousands, hundreds of thousands of people sponsored him that the figure went past a million and five million and 10 million and 15 million and further. By the time you hear this, because this is not live, by the way, by the time you hear this, it may well be over 20 million. And we've heard Prince William speaking of the tremendous inspiration that this man has been. What a remarkable story. What a touching story. What amazing determination on this man's part. What warm, cheering, hopeful news to lighten gloomy spirits during this difficult time. But let me say this to you. If we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have infinitely greater and eternally lasting strength, motivation, inspiration. Far more, we have the real and living power and presence of the living God himself in our hearts and souls. It's one thing to hear of a man who does something heroic at a ripe old age of nearly 100 and to gain inspiration from the example of somebody. It's a great thing to do, but it's a far greater thing that the living, eternal, saving power of the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is himself found in us. And this is what every one of us should hear and know this evening. Our lives are not shaped or defined by this present crisis or any other crisis or anything else. If you are a child of God, your life is defined by the fact that you know God and God is in you. The very life of God is in you. And that's what Habakkuk is saying here. He looks forward to a bleak time, a time far bleaker than we are in or may ever face. And he says, when I realize and when I know and when I experience that God is my strength, my feet become like the deer's, my heavy tread, my, my weak, trembling knees become light. I tread on high places. I have joy that fills me. Yes, I'm in a sad world as we're in a sad world. We are affected by the trials and the sadnesses of this world. But if you are in Christ, if you have come to Jesus Christ for salvation, your heart and your home is in Christ with God, breathing and tasting the glory of heaven, which is indeed your everlasting home, if you know God. Now, as I close, here's uh, an interesting little observation. Why does this book end the way it does? Why this rather strange, abrupt ending to the choir master with stringed instruments? We're used to seeing that kind of thing in the Bible, aren't we? But not normally at the end of a book like Habakkuk. We might see words like that at the beginning of one of the Psalms. To the chief musician, to the tune of the, the deer of the dawn, on stringed instruments, whatever it might be. Why does Habakkuk end with this strange, unusual, unexpected set of words? I think that there is a very clear answer. It is that Habakkuk, at this point, is moved to sing. And the joy in his heart means that he can do nothing other than sing for joy to the Lord. Now this evening, friends, there is no final hymn to follow uh, this preaching. But it may be that you, watching wherever you are, listening wherever you are, 
might want to respond by singing praise to God. Because this is what the gospel does to a Christian soul. Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins, risen for our life, our eternal life, is the one who is our strength, the one who is our salvation, the one who is our song. And that is why Christians down the ages have responded to the greatest good news of all by singing praise to the living God who saves and redeems his people. Though all may be very bleak, though all may seem very empty, though all may seem very hard, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, the God who saves the God who has made me his own, the God who has redeemed me, for he himself is my strength. He puts energy and spring and life in my whole being. He is the good news. He is eternal life. To know him is greater than life itself. May you all, dear friends, know that to be true for yourselves. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, our God, as we come to you at the end of this Lord's day, we pray that the joy that is found in you, that filled the heart of this prophet called Habakkuk over 2,600 years ago, might be a joy that we know today, for you have not changed. Your salvation has not changed. Your nature has not changed. Indeed, O oh Lord, we living as we live now, look back and not forward to the cross where the Lord Jesus himself underwent the greatest barrenness and famine and emptiness and darkness and lack and died that he might take up his life on the third day and give life to whoever calls on him and trusts and believes in him. Our Heavenly Father, we come now and we pray that your Holy Spirit would have great effect in many hearts and in many lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we come to the end of another Lord's Day. May God be with you all. May we see each other again soon. May we keep in touch with one another. Please do again visit the Grove Chapel Camberwell YouTube channel, visit our website, find out more, and uh, if any wish to be in touch, then you can go to the website and you can get in touch with us that way. May God be with us until we meet again.